Introduction to The Shaggy Man of Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Shaggy Man of Oz by Jack Snow. Founded on and continuing the famous Oz stories by L. Frank Baum. To the children. During the past few years, several readers have written to me asking, Whatever happened to the Gnome King's tunnel under the deadly desert? The answer will be found in this book. Everyone who has read the Oz books knows and loves Shaggy. He first met Dorothy in The Road to Oz, and from that time on had a number of adventures in which he discovered such famous Oz personages as the Patchwork Girl, Ojo, Unk Nunky, the Glass Cat, Betsy Bobbin and her mule Hank, and many others. So, it is about time that the Shaggy Man had an Oz book all his own, and here it is, faithfully recorded from the latest messages received from the land of Oz. Incidentally, you will recall that after Glinda laid down her barrier of invisibility, the only manner of communication between Oz and the great outside world was by radio. Well, now your author of the Oz books has succeeded in tuning in the Emerald City on a specially built television set, his magic picture. This has helped a great deal in the writing of this book, but not nearly so much as your own letters. So don't forget to write and tell me all your thoughts about the land of Oz and the equally interesting countries surrounding it. Just now, important things are happening there, which I hope to tell you about in another Oz book. Jack Snow This book is dedicated to my father, John Alonzo Snow. Santa Claus was good to me, gave me lots of things, wrapped in dainty parcels and tied with ribbon strings. I can't recall what lovely gifts within their chance to be. The wrappers and the ribbons were what are dear to me. They breathe of sweet remembrance, of love and kindly thought, the things about my presence that never could be bought. And so, although I'm far away, love's message spans the space, and our two hearts are linked anew through dear old Santa's grace. By L. Frank Baum a hitherto unpublished poem written to his sister, Mary Louise Brewster. End of introduction. Chapter One of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow, Chapter One. The Twins Look In. It just isn't fair, declared Tom, staring unhappily through the window at the heavy rain, pelting the lawn and garden about the house. Well, there's nothing we can do about it, so we might as well make the best of it, replied Twink philosophically. "'But I wanted to go outdoors and play this afternoon. "'You know we only have a few more weeks until school starts. "'Besides, I'm sick and tired of this old house "'and of every single thing we have to play with.' "'Almost as if he understood Tom's words, "'Tooful, the children's wooden clown "'tumbled over on his face in the corner "'where he had been standing neglected. "'Now look what you've done.' "'You've hurt Tooful's feelings,' accused Twink reprovingly, "'as she hastened to stand the funny little clown erect again "'in his corner of the room. "'Twink was especially fond of Tooful. "'The little wooden clown, with his hinged joints "'and gaudily painted features and clothing, "'had been a part of their lives almost as long as Twink could remember. "'He had taken part in many of their games, "'and, being constructed of a fine grade of durable wood, he had outlasted many other more fragile toys that had come and gone. Twink and Tom were twins. They lived in a large, comfortable house in the city of Buffalo, New York, with their mother and father, and Rosie the cook. This afternoon the house was very quiet. Twink's and Tom's father, Professor Jones, was at work at the university where he taught young people all about electrons, atoms, molecules, and other mysterious matters. Mrs. Jones was attending a meeting of her club of lady voters. 
Rosie, the cook, dozed in her warm kitchen, nodding over the latest issue of a fashion magazine. So it was no wonder the twins were a bit lonesome. The rain streamed down the window monotonously, and it seemed the afternoon would drag on forever. Twink glanced at the clock on the mantel. It was a little Dutch cottage clock, and the hands indicated it was almost three o'clock. Twink was struck with a sudden idea. Come on, Tom, she called. Look at the time. If we don't hurry, we'll miss chapter four of Buffalo Bill Rides Again. Tom came to life immediately, and in an instant both children were dashing down the broad stairway and into the library. Here was the solution to their dull afternoon, a TV set that Professor Jones had built himself and installed in the library. It was a very special set with a large projection screen. The glass tube of the television set enlarged the picture on the screen. At three o'clock each afternoon, Twink and Tom could see another chapter in the exciting moving picture serial of the Wild West. The children were sure, of course, that Buffalo Bill had been named after their own city, and this made the picture all the more interesting. Tom was busily turning knobs and dials and making adjustments. In a few seconds, the big screen lighted up with a bluish-green glare, and a moment later the pictures appeared. Buffalo Bill was ambushed by a wildly howling mob of redskins who were on the warpath. There was no doubt in Twink's and Tom's minds that the famous scout would emerge unharmed while the Indians would take to noisy flight. But just as Buffalo Bill brought his rifle to his shoulder and was sighting the nearest redskin, something happened. The flickering motion picture vanished from the television screen, and in its place appeared a picture that made the children gasp. It was one of the most beautiful scenes they could imagine, a peaceful rolling meadowland, bright with all kinds of wildflowers on which the sun shone down from a blue sky dotted with white baby clouds. In the distance rose the spires and minarets of a great castle, glittering and glistening in the sun. But it was not the castle or the sunny meadowland that held the children's attention. Twink and Tom stared unbelievingly at a figure that stood in the center of the television picture, looking out at them with the most familiar of smiles. It was Tufel, their wooden clown. End of chapter one. Chapter two of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter 2. On the Isle of Conjo. Good afternoon, children, said the clown, quite clearly and calmly. G Good afternoon, stammered Twink and Tom. The little clown suddenly doubled up with merriment and then gasped. If you could only see yourselves, you're all eyes positively bug-eyed, if I ever saw anyone who was. But what are you doing in the television picture? asked Twink, regaining a little of her composure. The clown disregarded her question and was suddenly serious. Come on, he ordered. Conjo can hold this picture only a few minutes, and you just have time to walk through. Walk through, echoed Tom. What do you mean? Start walking toward the television screen and you'll find out, answered the clown. Or perhaps, he added, you would rather stay there where it is raining and you can't go outdoors. But you're only a picture, objected Twink. Will you please do as I tell you and start walking toward the television screen, added the clown sternly. Twink and Tom looked at each other questioningly. Tom smiled and shrugged. Might as well try it. Can't do any harm, he said. That's the spirit, exclaimed the little clown, smiling again. Just join hands and walk straight toward me. Tom took 
Twink's hand and the two children slowly advanced toward the television screen. The screen was nearly five feet high, several inches taller than the children, and almost six feet wide. So vivid and real was the picture that Twink imagined she could really walk right into it. Just as the children were about to take the last step that would bring them directly in front of the television screen, a sudden powerful gust of wind hit their backs and sent them tumbling forward. This is where we'll catch it, thought Tom, sure that the wind must have blown them into the screen. He sat up, fully expecting to see the expensive screen torn to shreds. Instead, he saw an expanse of rolling meadowland, and he felt the warm sun beating down on his head. Twink was sitting beside him on the green grass, staring about in utter bewilderment. Before them stood the clown, smiling broadly. "'It's magic,' breathed Twink. "'Pure magic.' "'Well, it's magic, all right,' answered the clown. "'But I wouldn't say how pure it is.' "'But what has become of our library? "'And how did we get here? "'And how can this be real? "'And why is it you're not upstairs in my room?' "'The questions tumbled out almost faster than Twink could answer them. "'One question at a time, please,' said the clown, "'and I'll try to answer. "'Your library is right where it always is. "'This can be real, because it is real. "'And I am not in your room, because I belong here.' "'But Tufel protested Tom. "'We left you in Twink's room not fifteen minutes ago. "'You didn't leave me there, and don't call me Tufel,' objected the clown." By this time, Twink and Tom were standing up and brushing off their clothes. But you are our Tufel, you know, stated the girl. We have had you for years and years. I am not your Tufel of all the silly names, said the clown with some irritation. I am my own Twiffle. And how is it you look so much like our Tufel, asked Tom, who noted the clown was the same size as Tufel and looked like his double. I was about to tell you, explained the clown, that my name is Twiffle, and Twiffle is my third cousin. Oh, so then you know Twiffle, asked Twink curiously. Know him, replied Twiffle, of course I know him, and I also know you two very well. Many nights Twiffle and I have sat in your rooms with the moonlight streaming through the window and talked by the hour while you children slept. Twink and Tom said nothing. They were busy thinking. All this was so strange and had happened so unexpectedly and suddenly that they were still bewildered. Tom's eyes were puzzled as he asked, Just before we came through the screen, you said something about Conjo being able to hold the picture for only a few minutes. Who is Conjo? Twiffle was suddenly alert. That reminds me, he said, that we must be on our way at once. Conjo is expecting you, and we mustn't keep him waiting. Without another word, Twiffle started walking across the grass. The children followed. But who is this Conjo, and where does he live, asked Twink. And what does he want with us, added Tom. Without pausing to look at the children, Twiffle answered, Conjo is a wizard the sole ruler of this island, the Isle of Conjo. He lives in the castle you can see in the distance. What he wants with you, he will undoubtedly tell you himself. With this, the little clown flashed Twink and Tom a bright smile and then walked steadily on toward the glittering castle. Twink found that she had no trouble at all in keeping up with Twiffle because his legs were so short and his tride so small. She had plenty of time to pause occasionally and gather the colorful wildflowers that dotted the green meadowland. End of chapter two. Chapter three of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter 3. 
Omby Amby Bear's Bad News. Ozma, where is Ozma? I must see her at once, immediately. The soldier with the green whiskers had run all the way from the gates of the Emerald City of Oz to the royal palace, with his whiskers streaming at least six feet behind him. Now that he had arrived at the palace, he was panting and wild-eyed with excitement. "'Whatever is the matter with you, Omby Amby?' asked Jellia Jam, Ozma's dainty little maid, eyeing the distraught guardian of the gates with undisguised curiosity. Omby Amby groaned. "'Something terrible has happened. I must report it to Ozma at once.' "'Can't you give me just an inkling of what it is?' coaxed Jellia. "'No,' replied Omby Amby firmly. "'The soldier, who was Ozma's royal army, "'was rapidly regaining his composure and his breath "'after his wild dash through the emerald-studded streets of the city. "'Well, then, come along,' replied Jellia Jam with a sigh. "'I suppose I shall have to wait for Ozma to tell me "'what has upset you so terribly.' The little maid led the way down the corridors of the royal palace until she came to a large double door. Here she knocked, and a moment later, Ozma's voice answered, Come in. Jellia Jam opened the door, and the soldier with the green whiskers followed her into the room. This was Ozma's library, where the shelves that rose from the floor to the ceiling were filled with magic books of records. The little ruler of Oz was seated at a table deep in the study of one of the books. She looked up questioningly as Omby Amby stood before her. Jellia Jam silently departed, closing the door behind her. Your Highness, began Omby Amby, it is my painful duty to report a most regrettable misfortune. What is it, Omby Amby? asked Ozma with a kindly smile. What has happened? "'It's the love magnet, your highness,' gulped the soldier. "'It's been broken.' "'Broken!' exclaimed Ozma, rising from her chair. "'How could that ever have happened?' "'It was the nail,' explained Omby Amby miserably. "'If your highness will recall, "'the love magnet has been hanging from a nail "'over the gates of the Emerald City for many years. "'In fact, ever since the shaggy man came to live in the land of Oz.' "'Yes, I know,' said Ozma. "'Well,' went on the soldier, "'the nail must have rusted, and this morning it snapped. "'The love magnet fell to the bricks of the yellow road "'and broke into two pieces.' "'Ozma's face was grave. "'You brought the pieces with you?' she asked. "'Yes, your highness, I did,' replied Omby Amby. "'Delving into one of his pockets, "'he handed Ozma the two pieces of the love magnet, a small bit of metal, shaped like a horseshoe, when it was whole. Ozma held the broken love magnet in her hand, regarding it sadly. It is too bad, she said, that so wonderful a charm should be broken. Do you mean it can't be repaired, your highness? asked Omby Amby. Of that I am not sure, replied Ozma. Perhaps the first thing we should do is ask the shaggy man to come here, and explain to him how the love magnet came to be broken, since it does, after all, really belong to him. I will go for him immediately, said the soldier, turning to the door. You will find him in the garden with Dorothy and Jack Pumpkinhead, who is trying on a new head, said Ozma, as Omby Amby made a low bow and closed the door behind him. By luck, Ozma reflected, the shaggy man was in the Emerald City, she knew that Shaggy was fond of making long trips about the land of Oz, exploring the little-known corners and regions of this most famous of all fairylands. Now he had just returned from a visit with his brother, who was in the Gillikin country. While she waited, Ozma recalled how the Shaggy man had befriended Dorothy in the outside world and had found his way to the land of Oz in the company of little Dorothy. With him he had brought the love magnet, the curious magical talisman which caused whoever carried it to be loved by all he met. Shaggy had gratefully accepted Ozma's invitation to make his home in the land of Oz, and since he had no further need for the love magnet, 
Ozma had caused it to be hung over the gates of the Emerald City, so that all who entered might be loving and loved. Before she had done this, however, Ozma had wisely altered the powers of the love magnet, so that the talisman did not automatically cause the person who carried it to be loved by all he met, but must be displayed by its carrier before the eyes of the person or persons whose love he wished to win. Thus, control of the powers of the magnet were given to its owner. All this had happened so long ago that it was now duly written down in Professor Wogglebug's Chronicles of the Land of Oz. Ozma's reflections were ended by the appearance of Omby Amby and the Shaggy Man, who had no idea that anything was the matter. Dorothy said to tell you, Your Highness, that it's one of the best heads Jack ever had, the Shaggy Man announced with satisfaction as he entered the room. Dorothy's fitting it on Jack's body now. Won't you sit down, please, Shaggy Man, invited Ozma. The little ruler's expression was so serious that the shaggy man asked with concern, What is it, Ozma? What's wrong? Ozma answered silently by extending her palm, on which lay the halves of the broken love magnet. The shaggy man's eyes clouded. Oh, that is too bad. I was very fond of the love magnet. It always made me feel happy whenever I entered or left the Emerald City. How did it come to be broken? Ozma explained in a few words what had happened. "'But can't the love magnet be repaired?' asked the shaggy man. "'I should think it would be an easy matter for you or the wizard or Glinda "'to put it together again as good as new.' "'No,' Ozma shook her head. "'It isn't as simple as that. "'A long time ago I looked up the history of the love magnet "'in my magic record books, "'and I found that, if broken, it could be made whole only by one person, the person who created it. And who, asked the shaggy man with deep interest, is that? It has been so long ago, admitted Ozma, that I've forgotten who it was, but I can look it up in a few seconds. Ozma moved to the far side of the library, where she selected one of the magic record books and opened it on a table. After turning the pages until she found the one containing the love magnet's history, Ozma ran her finger down the finely printed column. Here it is, she announced. The man who made the love magnet and the only person who can repair it is a wizard named Conjo, who lives on a tiny island in the middle of the Nonestic Ocean. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter Four. Ozma Uses the Magic Belt. Omby Amby had returned to his post at the gates of the Emerald City, and Ozma and the Shaggy Man had retired to the Chamber of Magic. Here were kept many of the most valuable magical instruments in all the land of Oz. There's only one thing to be done, the Shaggy Man was saying. I must take the broken love magnet to this Conjo and ask him to repair it. I'm not at all sure that Conjo will agree to repair the love magnet for you, Ozma replied, with a troubled expression. You see, we know very little about this Conjo. He lives alone on this tiny island in the middle of the Nonestic Ocean and practices magic. There's no record of his actually misusing his magical powers, nor, so far as we know, has he caused trouble for anyone. However, we have reason to believe he's rather selfish and thoughtless, and that he might cause harm without really meaning to, just to satisfy his vanity. Also, it might not suit his whim to mend the love magnet. "'What is the name of the island on which Conjo lives?' asked the shaggy man, musingly. "'It is called the Isle of Conjo, and since it is many miles from the land of Oz, I have no power over the wizard at all.' 
In fact, concluded Ozma, that is the reason we here in the land of Oz know so little about Conjo. Nevertheless, maintained the shaggy man, I think I should go as soon as possible to this island and do everything I can to persuade Conjo to make the love magnet whole. Even after you cross the deadly desert, you would have several days' journey through the land of Ev, and then you would only be on the shores of the Nonestic Ocean. So I think it would be best, since you are determined to make the journey, for me to use the magic belt to transport you directly to the Isle of Conjo. The shaggy man willingly agreed to this plan, stating that he was ready to leave at once. First, said Ozma, let us have a look at the Isle of Conjo and the magic picture. The girl ruler swept aside the velvet curtain that hung over the magic picture when it was not in use. The picture appeared to be a peaceful country farmland scene with purple hills rising in the distance. Show us the Isle of Conjo in the Nonestic Ocean, said Ozma. Immediately the picture shifted and changed. It now reflected a gently rolling meadowland with a great castle in the distance. Approaching the castle were a young girl and a boy, accompanied by the figure of a little wooden clown. Ozma gasped in surprise. Those are human children, shaggy man. What can they be doing there when my magic record books state that Conjo is the only human being on the island? We can see that the clown accompanying them is a puppet, evidently brought to life by Conjo. Perhaps they are lost, ventured the shaggy man. But how would they get to the island? It is surrounded by miles and miles of ocean. I don't know, admitted the shaggy man, but it is one more good reason for me to go there as quickly as possible. Those children may be in need of help. I agree with you, said Ozma quickly. You must find out what the children are doing on the island and see that they are returned to their homes. If you cannot do that, then you must bring them with you to the land of Oz. Will you use the magic belt to tra transport us back to the land of Oz? asked the shaggy man. That will be impossible, stated Ozma, since I must leave this afternoon to visit Glinda the Good. We are working on some extremely important magic charms in which the powers of the magic belt are needed. I am not sure how long I will be gone, perhaps for several weeks. However, Ozma went on, as she stepped to a heavy wooden chest, opened one of its drawers, and withdrew a small object, I want you to take this with you. It will enable you to return to the land of Oz any time you wish. What is it? asked the shaggy man curiously. It is a magic compass, explained Ozma. You will notice that it is not round in shape like ordinary compasses but is formed like a rectangle, as is the land of Oz. Shaggy looked at the magic compass and found that instead of being marked north, south, east, and west, as is the usual compass, it bore the words Gillikin, Quadling, Winky, and Munchkin, which are the four countries making up the land of Oz. Should you wish to return to any one of the four countries, Ozma went on, just set the compass needle to the one to which you wish to journey. If you want to come directly to the Emerald City, you have only to spin the needle of the compass, and you will be here as quickly as the magic belt could bring you. The shaggy man inspected the magic compass more closely and found that the pivot on which the needle rested rose from a spot of green in the very center of the compass. This green spot, he knew, represented the Emerald City. But what about the children, the shaggy man asked. If I can find no way to send them home, I cannot simply leave them on the island. Of course not, replied Ozma. If you think it necessary to bring them to Oz with you, just have them put their arms in yours, then spin the compass needle, and all three of you will be transported to the Emerald City. The shaggy man placed the magic compass carefully in his pocket and said, Perhaps it would be well for me to be on my way. There's no telling what will happen on that island, and those two children may need help. Ozma slipped on the magic belt. Goodbye, dear friend, she said, smiling fondly at the shaggy man. 
return as quickly as you can. Then she made the magic signal, and the shaggy man was no longer in the Chamber of Magic. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. Chapter Five: The Castle of Conjo. Hello, Twink. Tom and Twiffle stopped in their tracks. From out of nowhere had suddenly appeared a man of medium height, with rosy cheeks, twinkling blue eyes, shaggy hair, and clothing that, while it was composed of the finest silks and satins, was nevertheless a mass of shags and bobtails. Twiffle was so surprised he found it impossible to speak. Twink was regarding the stranger seriously. Suddenly, recognition lighted up her eyes. Oh, it can't be, the little girl cried. You just can't be the famous shaggy man of Oz. The shaggy man smiled. Don't know about the famous part, but I am known as the shaggy man, and until a few seconds ago, I was in the land of Oz. Oh, seeing you here made me think, maybe this was a part of the land of Oz, said Twink, who had begun to hope since the moment she had recognized the shaggy man. Tom was regarding the new arrival curiously. Yes, he said, you certainly do look just like your pictures in the books. How did you get here so fast? Magic? I suppose the land of Oz is quite a distance. Right, both times, replied the shaggy man. Ozma sent me here with her magic belt, and the land of Oz is many miles away from here. Why did Ozma send you? asked Twink. Oh, I have a little business with this Conjo fellow, answered the shaggy man. You have business with Conjo? Twiffle had recovered from his astonishment. Then you must forgive me for not greeting you more properly. It is so seldom we have visitors on the island. Looks like you already have two visitors, observed the shaggy man, staring at Twink and Tom. Yes, but they were expected and invited, pointed out Twiffle primly. However, since you have business with Conjo, and we are on our way to see him, there's no reason you should not accompany us. No reason whatever, agreed the shaggy man. I hope this Conjo has plenty of big red apples. Why? asked Tom. They happen to be my favorite food, that's all, explained the shaggy man. Led by Twiffle, the shaggy man and the two children were advancing over the meadow toward the castle of Conjo. The sun was now setting, burnishing the spires and turrets of the castle with rich hues of gold and copper. The shaggy man judged they had less than half a mile to travel to the castle doors. Don't you children think introductions are in order, asked the shaggy man, since you seem to know me already? Well, Twink began, this is Twiffle, who was a third cousin of Twoful. Twiffle bowed briefly, and the shaggy man nodded. And this is Tom, and I am Twink. We live in Buffalo. Wait a minute, interrupted the shaggy man. How did you happen to get a name like Twink? Twink and Tom are not our real names, explained Tom. Our parents named us Abadiah and Zebediah. Why did they do that? asked the shaggy man indignantly. Well, Tom went on, they didn't expect twins. We are twins, you know. And they couldn't make up their minds what to name us. So they just picked names at the beginning and end of the alphabet. That's how we came to be named from A to Z. The shaggy man sighed. And then, Twink carried on, I began to toddle when I was supposed to still be crawling. And everyone called me Twink, because I got from one place to the other in a twinkle. Tom got his nickname in a funny way, too. I have always been interested in everything mechanical and electrical, explained Tom. So when I was only two years old and took my toy phonograph apart to see where the little men and women who made the talking and music were, my father said, Why, you're a regular little Tom Edison. 
and so ever since then I've been Tom. At least they are better than those other names, said the shaggy man. Conjo's castle loomed even larger, casting lengthening shadows as the sun lowered behind it. In a few more minutes, Twiffle had led them to a large door that was evidently the entrance of the castle. Hanging on the door was a sign which Twink, Tom, and the Shaggy Man read, Castle of Conjo, Working Wizard. This way, please, said Twiffle. The door opened at his touch, and they entered. All they could see was a vast corridor with doors on each side. At the end of the corridor was a handsome marble staircase that wound to the upper floors. Twiffle's little wooden feet pattered busily down the polished marble floor of the corridor until he came to an arch-shaped doorway upon which hung the sign, Quiet Wizard at Work. As they paused before this door with its strange admonition, the shaggy man and his friends heard a sound that reminded them of a buzz saw. I wonder, ventured Twink, if Conjo is building some new magical machine. Twiffle disregarded the little girl's question and proceeded to push the door which opened as easily as had the door of the castle. Inside they found a vast domed room. All around the sides of the room was a series of tables, workbenches, and tall cabinets. The tables and benches were filled with every kind of chemical instrument imaginable. Beakers, retorts, test tubes, hundreds of bottles of different kinds of colored liquids, crucibles, and a series of burners, over which simmered vials and pots of chemical mixtures. From these rose vari-colored vapors, filling the room with a pungent haze. The cabinet shelves were crowded and jumbled with thousands of containers of various powders, ointments, and mixtures used by wizards in working their magic spells. One cabinet contained nothing but books of magic recipes and formulas, everything from changing people into doorknobs to curing headaches. The shaggy man and the children had scarcely glanced at all this array of tools and materials for working magic when their attention was drawn to a huge divan that rested in the very middle of the marble floor of the great chamber. This luxurious divan was covered with the softest and most expensive of rich velvet robes and comforts. Curled up in a ball in the midst of the blankets and downy satin-covered cushions was a little man. He was snoring. Twink almost laughed aloud. So this was Conjo, the working wizard. She realized now it was Conjo snoring they'd mistaken for the sound of a buzz saw. Twiffle seemed neither surprised nor disturbed to find his master sound asleep. The little clown trotted over to the handsome divan and, seizing Conjo by the shoulder, shook him vigorously. The shaggy man was grinning broadly and Tom was holding a hand over his mouth to suppress his laughter. Sputtering and yawning, Conjo sat up on the divan. Since he was rubbing the sleep out of his eyes with his knuckles, he did not see his guests for several seconds. Then he blinked, yawned widely, and smiling a little foolishly said, Well, whiz my wand if it isn't Twink and Tom. You already know us? asked Twink. Oh, goodness, yes, replied Conjo, stretching lazily. Twiffle has been telling me about you for years, ever since you were mere babies. I let Twiffle visit your friend Twoffle in your home, you know. Sent him there by my magic, explained Conjo proudly. Conjo was coming more awake every minute. Jumping June bugs, he exclaimed as his eyes fell on the shaggy man. I didn't tell Twiffle to bring your father along. Or is this person your grandfather? Neither one, said the shaggy man with an amused smile. Your magic had nothing to do with my coming here, Conjo. I came of my own accord. Came from where, demanded Conjo, and then went on before the shaggy man had a chance to answer. You were shipwrecked, that must be it, of course. You are a poor, forlorn castaway, a helpless victim of the deep and mighty ocean. No, contradicted the shaggy man, I was not shipwrecked. I came here from the land of Oz. 
Conjo started. The land of Oz, he exclaimed incredulously. You mean the Emerald City? Ozma, Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, Scraps, Toto? And then, because he was out of breath, the wizard concluded weakly, And all of that? I see you have heard of the land of Oz, said the shaggy man, so perhaps you will know why I am here. Conjo, who was a fat, bald little man, not much taller than Twink or Tom, with a fringe of white hair about his pink head, closed his little eyes, placed a forefinger on his cherry-like nose, and thought hard. "'You will just have to tell me,' he said, opening his eyes and staring appealingly at the shaggy man. "'I don't have a single idea. It usually takes several hours after I wake up before I get any ideas.' and it is so seldom that we have shipwrecks. I told you, the shaggy man reminded Conjo patiently, that I was not shipwrecked. I came here from the land of Oz to ask you to do me a favor. A favor, said Conjo, thinking hard. Why, that is strange indeed. The last shipwrecked person who was here wanted me to do him a favor, too. He stayed several months and then wanted to return to his home. He asked me to make a boat for him. That was an easy trick, and because the fellow wasn't a bad sort at all, I made him a present. I gave him one of my newest creations, the love magnet. The love magnet, gasped the shaggy man. Don't interrupt, please, went on Conjo. Not polite, you know. This shipwrecked person tied the love magnet onto the mast of his boat and set sail. Last I ever saw of him. Understand he encountered a whale who, upon seeing the man and the love magnet, became so fond of the fellow that he ate him. Conjo wiped a tear from his eye. The shaggy man wasn't sure whether the wizard was serious or was poking fun at him. He decided to pretend, at any rate, that he accepted Conjo's absurd story, saying, Well, apparently the unfortunate man's boat was blown ashore, and an Eskimo found the love magnet, for it was an Eskimo who gave it to me, and I took it to the land of Oz. My love magnet in the land of Oz? exclaimed Conjo. No, replied the shaggy man, not your love magnet, since you gave it away. It now belongs to all the people of the land of Oz. That is why I'm here now. The love magnet has been broken. The favor I ask you is to repair it since you, its creator, are the only person who can do that. Twink and Tom had been listening with deep interest to this conversation. They had read about the love magnet, and they were surprised to learn that it had been broken. Of course, of course, my dear shaggy man, for I perceive that it is indeed who you are, a quite famous personage of the land of Oz. Conjo was wide awake now. I shall be most happy to mend the love magnet if it can be mended, but surely you don't expect me to do so important and difficult a feat of magic without, uh, let us say, uh, a reward? End of chapter 5「Looks like you already have two visitors,' observed the shaggy man staring at Twink and Tom. Chapter 6 of Shaggy Man in Oz This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow Chapter 6 the magic airmobile. Yes, that's it, said Conjo, nodding his round head so violently that his three chins rippled like the steps of an escalator. You have asked me to do you a favor, a very great favor, so it is only just that I should claim a reward. That's fair, isn't it? Conjo was regarding the shaggy man with eyes from which was gone the somewhat foolish innocence. The shaggy man considered uneasily. He was beginning to remember Ozma's warning that Conjo was not to be trusted entirely. "'What kind of a reward could I give you?' the shaggy man asked. 
Conjo's finger shot out, pointing toward the shaggy man. That, he said, that in your pocket will be my reward. Involuntarily, the shaggy man's hand went to his pocket, in which rested the magic compass Ozma had given him. "'You must be joking,' said the shaggy man, incredulously. "'The magic compass belongs to Ozma, and if I did give it to you, how would I return to the land of Oz? No, what you ask is impossible.' Conjo's voice was wheedling. "'Surely you don't think Ozma expected me to repair the love magnet for nothing, do you?' I can assure you that Ozma will regard the trading of the magic compass for the repair of the love magnet an excellent bargain. Actually, the magic compass is, by Ozma's standards, a minor bit of magic. The shaggy man was perplexed. Perhaps Conjo was right. Supposing I do give you the magic compass, then how will I get back to Oz? Conjo's eyes glowed. "'Nothing to it,' he declared. "'You can return to Oz any time you like, "'just as soon as I repair the love magnet, if you wish. "'Of course I would be happy should you care to remain my guest for a time, "'but the decision is entirely up to you.' "'How do you propose that I return to Oz?' asked the shaggy man. "'I can't walk across the deadly desert, you know.' "'Ha! Ho! Ho! Ho!' Conjo laughed, walk across the deadly desert. Certainly not. You shall sail high across it, swiftly and safely. Come with me, I have something to show you. Conjo wriggled about until his fat little body emerged from the cushions and silken coverings of the divan. As he stood up, the shaggy man and his friends saw that the little man was dressed in a loose robe of rich purple on which were embroidered stars, crescents, black cats, and the signs of the zodiac. All these designs were in the brightest colors, while the robe flowed about him, secured by a golden cord tied about his middle. On his feet were sandals woven of silver thread, with toes that curled up like question marks. "'Come with me,' repeated the fat little wizard as he waddled to the door, and I will show you. How you can sail away in a jiffy. The shaggy man and the two children followed Conjo, while Twiffle remained behind, busily arranging and straightening the royal cushions and comforters of the royal divan. In the great corridor, Conjo paused before a small door that opened at his touch, revealing a cage-like little room. Step in, the wizard invited his guests. This is an elevator that will whisk us to the roof of the tallest tower of the castle, an improvement over the stairway, up which I find it difficult to whisk myself in my present state of what, shall we say, stoutness? Conjo beamed good humor and friendliness as the elevator shot noiselessly upward. In a few seconds the door clicked, slid open, and Conjo led his guests to the roof of the great tower. From this height they could see that the Isle of Conjo was small indeed, for the blue waters of the nonestic ocean were visible in any direction they looked. The sun was a great red ball of fire in the west, but it would still be several minutes before actual twilight set in. And here, said Conjo, leading them across the roof, is the means by which I propose you return to the land of Oz. The shaggy man and the children saw before them a most curious object. It might have been the body of an automobile, except that it seemed to have neither front nor back. Both ends of it curled up like a gondola. Nor did it have wheels. The flat bottom rested solidly on the roof. To all appearances it had no means of locomotion. Conjo was regarding the strange object proudly. Behold, he said, one of my most ingenious creations, the airmobile. You mean to say, the shaggy man sighed, that this thing is actually supposed to fly through the air? Conjo looked hurt. You see before you, he said resentfully, the most perfect means of air travel yet invented. Tom broke in. But how can it fly? It has no wings, no propeller, no jets. 
nothing but places to sit down. Conjo regarded the boy pityingly. Do you suppose I would rely upon such clumsy and inefficient means of flying as propellers, wings, and jets? The airmobile is the perfect flying machine. It repels gravity. It does what? asked the shaggy man. Conjo stepped to the machine and opened one of the doors. Look, he said, see these metal plates on the floor of the ship? They are gravity resistor plates. You must know, he went on patiently, that it's the force of gravity pulling objects to the earth that causes things to have weight. Well, my gravity resistor plates overcome gravity when exposed. Hence, the ship has no weight whatever. Yes, said Tom, I can understand that. But what makes it move? Backward and forward and upward, I mean. Oh, that, sniffed Conjo. These are gravity resistor plates. They not only overcome gravity, but resist it. The power of resistance forces the machine upward. The more surface of the plates you expose, the higher you will go. And you will notice, Conjo continued, reaching inside the ship and pressing a button, that the metal plates are mounted on rods through their middle so that they may be operated like flaps or fins, and they rotate. Thus, if you tilt them in one direction, the resistance to gravity forces you ahead in one way. Tilt them in the other direction, and you travel in the opposite way. Rotate them, and you can veer to the right or left. If it works, it is wonderful, said the shaggy man doubtfully. Oh, it works to perfection, assured Conjo. If it were not so late in the day, I would propose a little trip. As it is, I suggest that we go downstairs for dinner. Then I will have to leave you to examine the love magnet. We will all arise early in the morning, at which time you will have the pleasure of a journey over the island in my airmobile. Twink guessed that Conjo's dinner must have been prepared and served by magic, for there were no servants in the grand dining room into which their round little host ushered them. But the food was quite as elaborate and rich as the dining room itself. The shaggy man and the children were hungry, and they ate heartily. Even so, they could not help noticing that Conjo ate nearly twice as much as the shaggy man. Shaggy was gratified to find a large bowl of rosy-cheeked apples in the center of the table, which made the meal a perfect one for him. Conjo sighed with content, wiping his lips on a fine damask napkin. Inhospitable as it may seem, he apologized, I must leave you now to see if the love magnet can be repaired. I will examine it in my laboratory and tell you tomorrow if it can be fixed. Please give me the love magnet. This the shaggy man did, and Conjo waddled to the door, pausing to say, Twiffle will show you to your rooms. I hope you sleep well. I know I shall, after I finish this work. Conjo was already yawning as he left the dining room. A few seconds later, Twiffle appeared in the doorway and invited Shaggy and the children to follow him. The sleeping rooms to which Twiffle led them up the marble stairway were on the second floor and were beautifully furnished with every convenience and comfort. Twink and Tom's room contained two inviting beds, and Twink noticed that pajamas of just the right size had been carefully laid out. Conjo seemed to think of everything. "'See you children in the morning,' said the shaggy man as he entered his room which adjoined that of Twink and Tom. The shaggy man found his bed soft and luxurious, so he slipped off his shaggy clothes, carefully arranging them on a chair, so that not one frill or fur below was out of place, put on the pajamas which Conjo had also provided for him, and slipped into bed. Instantly the light faded from the room. More magic, thought the shaggy man a little uneasily, for it had appeared to him that the light was an ordinary electric one which he might switch on and off at will. But moonlight was beginning to fall through the window, so the shaggy man sighed with content and in a minute was sound asleep. 
It was several hours later when the shaggy man stirred and then sat up wide awake. What had awakened him? He was sure he had heard a clicking sound, like the door of his bedchamber closing. The moonlight revealed that the door was closed just as he had left it. Shaggy glanced at his clothes on the chair. He leaped from bed and searched through the pockets of his clothing. He gave a gasp of dismay. The magic compass was gone. What was this? In another pocket, Shaggy found a hard metallic object, the love magnet perfectly repaired with no trace of its ever having been broken. The shaggy man sat down on his bed and thought hard. What should he do? For some reason, Conjo had evidently entered the room, slipped the repaired love magnet into Shaggy's pocket, removed the magic compass, and left the room. It was the clicking of the door that Shaggy had heard, and Conjo had slightly disarranged Shaggy's clothes. That had called his attention to them. What did all this mean? Shaggy was sure now that Conjo was not the jolly, straightforward person he pretended to be. Perhaps he was not exactly evil either, but he was so vain and scheming and selfish that he would bear watching. Then a sudden thought struck Shaggy and made him extremely uneasy. He had come to the Isle of Conjo of his own accord to seek out Conjo, but it was Conjo himself who had brought Twink and Tom there. Why? Were the twins in danger? What was Conjo's purpose in taking them from their home? It was up to him, thought the shaggy man, to find out and protect them if Conjo meant them harm or had some crazy plan that would endanger them. Shaggy unhappily concluded there was nothing he could do now. In the morning, he would find out if the airmobile was everything Conjo claimed. Then he would try to discover Conjo's plans for Twink and Tom. Perhaps Twiffle could enlighten him. Shaggy sighed. Well, at least he did have the love magnet. The shaggy man lay down on the bed and tried to sleep. After a long time, he drifted into a fitful slumber, broken by dreams in which Conjo sailed through the air, clutching the love magnet, and Twink and Tom were transformed into dolls no larger than Twiffle. In his dream, the shaggy man seemed to be bound with ropes to his bed, powerless to stop any of Conjo's mischief, while Twiffle tugged at his bonds, saying, Wake up, shaggy man, wake up! Shaggy opened his eyes and stared. There was Twiffle at the side of his bed, shaking him and saying, Wake up, shaggy man, wake up. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of Shaggy Man in Oz. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Shaggy Man in Oz by Jack Snow. In High Town. The shaggy man was awake in an instant. What is it, Twiffle? What is wrong? There is no time to lose, whispered Twiffle. Quick, get into your clothes, and I will arouse the children. Shaggy dressed as speedily as possible, but no sooner had he finished than Twiffle, followed by Twink and Tom, now wide-eyed with excitement and fully dressed, appeared in the doorway. Come, Twiffle whispered. Silently Shaggy and the children followed Twiffle down the marble stairway to the elevator. The castle was not entirely dark, thanks to the bright moonlight flowing through the windows. They stepped into the elevator which had a dim light of its own. Once more it shot up to the roof of the tower. Stepping out on the roof, Twiffle beckoned them after him. The clown made his way straight to the magic airmobile. He climbed in, motioning for Shaggy and the children to do likewise. They all squeezed into the contraption after him. 
twink noted the cushion seats in each end of the airmobile were soft and yielding conjo certainly liked comfort where are we going and why demanded the shaggy man there is no time to talk now reported twiffle briefly wait until we are well in the air do you know how to operate this thing asked tom i have watched conjo run it many times i am sure i can manage it replied twiffle the little clown was busy with the buttons which exposed the gravity resistor plates and almost before they realized it the airmobile had risen gently from the roof and was moving silently through the night ah that is a relief sighed twiffle as he watched conjo's castle recede in the distance but where are we going asked twink who was thoroughly enjoying the ride through the cool night air the main thing explained twiffle is to get as far away from conjo as possible then he is a villain as i suspected said shaggy twiffle nodded conjo is a curious man he repaired the love magnet because he couldn't bear seeing one of his own charms broken he is very vain actually he doesn't care anything about the love magnet which has no effect on him since he made it he doesn't love anyone and he doesn't want anyone to love him he came to this island many years ago he wanted to be alone since he disliked people and desired only to work on his wizard charms and incantations he brought me to life merely to amuse himself and to have someone to talk to when he felt like boasting recently he has become restless he has found that after all he wants someone before whom he can show off his magic tricks but he hesitated to bring many people to the island fearing they would steal some of his precious magic tools twiffle paused and sighed he went on i had made the mistake of telling him about you twink and tom those visits he permitted me to your home while you slept were the only kindness conjo ever showed me so i don't feel i owe him any allegiance even though he did bring me to life well yesterday conjo announced he was going to use his magic to bring you children to his island i see murmured twink and so you have rescued us i hope so replied twiffle after what i found out tonight i couldn't let you stay here conjo talks in his sleep a great deal and tonight he mumbled enough for me to learn completely for the first time what his plans are for you two children what do you mean plans asked tom why conjo was going to make you drink a magic potion that would wipe out all memory of your home parents and former lives then you would be content to stay on the island with him how dreadful exclaimed twink shuddering and i suppose he never meant for me to return to the land of oz said shaggy man oh no replied twiffle conjo wanted your magic compass badly because it possesses a kind of magic that he knows nothing about i believe he meant to transport you to the land of eve where you could find your way back to oz as best you could but now said twink happily the airmobile will take us all to the land of oz twiffle shook his head no he said i'm afraid it won't conjo is a clever wizard of sorts but he is not powerful enough to invent a machine that will fly across the deadly desert you mean this contraption won't carry us over the desert and back to oz the shaggy man asked greatly disturbed no said twiffle 
I have heard of powerful birds managing to fly high enough to cross the deadly desert, but I know of no magic that can penetrate the barrier of invisibility that Glinda the Good spread across the deadly waste many years ago. Certainly not Conjo's magic. Then what shall we do? asked the shaggy man. As I said, reminded Twiffle, the most important thing was to get out of Conjo's power. The airmobile will carry us to the edge of the deadly desert, but no farther. The shaggy man was silent, considering. Once he had managed to cross the deadly desert in sandboat. That had been before Glinda had laid down the magic barrier. But even since then, others had crossed the desert. So the shaggy man did not give up all hope. The airmobile was carrying them swiftly and silently through the night. Below them, waters of the non istic ocean gleamed silver in the moonlight. There was just the faintest rocking motion as the airmobile sped along. Perhaps it was this and the fact that Shaggy and the two children were deep in their own thoughts that made them all fall asleep before they knew it. Twiffle smiled and applied himself to the operation of the airmobile. He had no need for sleep. Twink was the first to awaken. The sun was well up in the sky, and the morning was bright and clear. She shook Tom awake at the same time the shaggy man arose himself. They looked over the side of the craft and saw below them a pleasant land of hills and rolling farmlands. The land of Eve, announced the shaggy man. We shouldn't be so very far from the deadly desert now. Twiffle had looked up and was staring ahead of him in amazement. The little clown slowed down the airmobile. Directly ahead of them was a cluster of little houses and buildings, a good-sized village in the sky. What in the world can that be? gasped Twink. The airmobile was moving very slowly as they approached the sky village. Directly before them, on what would have been the outskirts of the town had it been on earth was a sign reading you are now entering high town population five hundred and twenty two altitude approximately fifteen thousand feet but it varies they could see people walking about among the houses just as though they were on solid ground the shaggy man shook his head. Twink and Tom were staring, fascinated. The airmobile glided silently a few feet past the sign. Then it jerked several times and came to an abrupt halt. Twiffle looked puzzled. He pushed one button, then another, and another. Nothing happened. Twiffle did it all over again, a bit frantically this time still nothing happened it's no use said twiffle the airmobile won't budge we're stuck in mid-air end of chapter seven chapter eight of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c shaggy man in oz by jack snow the lord high mayor while twiffle fussed with the controls of the magic airmobile a crowd of curious people began to gather about the stalled aircraft they were men women and children and even dogs and they walked on the air easily and unconcernedly, as if it were the normal thing to do. These people were all very tall and exceedingly thin. The grown-ups were well over eight feet in height, while the older children averaged about six feet tall. Perhaps the fact that they lived so high up 
had caused them to grow that way too their clothing was what we would consider old-fashioned but was neat and well cared for the women wore the brightest of colors which flashed gaily in the clear sunlight the people chattered among themselves pointing toward the airmobile and several dogs barked excitedly a loud voice exclaimed what is the meaning of this what is going on here the crowd made way for the speaker who proved to be a sour-faced tall individual wearing a frock coat and a high silk hat a stovepipe hat the shaggy man would have called it pardon us began the shaggy man but i am afraid we are the cause of all the excitement you see our airship has stalled just inside your town the tall man stared curiously at the occupants of the airmobile as he said of course your machine won't operate in high town in fact a flying machine in high town is an utter absurdity against all the town ordinances and rules i must ask you to remove it immediately not very friendly is he remarked tom but twiffle was interested what do you mean sir that our aircraft is against your laws the tall man sniffed it should be apparent to you that the last thing in the sky we need is an airplane here in this favored spot we walk on air and are not compelled to crawl across the earth like worms yes said the shaggy man we can all see that but tell us your honor do you think we would be able to walk on air as you do the top-hatted man was distinctly flattered by the shaggy man's mode of dress ah he replied i can see that you recognize me as a person of importance i am the lord high mayor of hightown and my word here represents the highest law of the land as for your being able to walk as we do on air i see no reason why you shouldn't since in hightown there is no gravity to pull you to the earth what was that you said no gravity twiffle was obviously excited exactly replied the lord high mayor with great dignity within the boundaries of hightown the earth does not exert the least bit of gravity none whatsoever then that explains it said twiffle the airmobile operates on the principle of gravity and since there is no gravity here the craft is useless what are we to do asked the shaggy man i am not sure i want to go walking around on the air although these folks seem to take to it naturally enough tell me said twiffle addressing the lord high mayor is hightown of very great area oh exclaimed the lord high mayor it is simply enormous no less than four square acres of the most delightful air have you any idea your honor asked the shaggy man how we can get our flying machine out of hightown oh that's very simple replied lord high mayor since your craft has only just crossed the boundary into hightown i would suggest that you get out and push the machine to the edge of the boundary then push it a few inches more and it will be in the field of gravity again where it is equipped to operate of course exclaimed twiffle joyfully why didn't i think of that the lord high mayor smiled with smug satisfaction i'll adjust these gravity plates now continued twiffle so that the plane won't fall when it passes the boundary after he had pressed some buttons he and the shaggy man and twink and tom climbed out of the airmobile the air seemed as solid under their feet as the earth nevertheless this walking on thin air was a most curious experience and in spite of themselves they found they were treading gingerly as though they were walking on eggs the lord high mayor and the crowd of high towners that had gathered watched curiously as the shaggy man and tom slowly pushed the airmobile toward the boundary of high town it was no task at all since the airmobile had no weight 
they knew the sign that had greeted them as they entered hightown marked the spot where gravity again exerted its pull so they pushed the airmobile slowly over this invisible line zoom like an arrow shot from a bow the airmobile darted upward far above their heads it continued its mad climb into the sky so fast did it move that within a few seconds it was visible only as a tiny speck far above them what in the sky has happened gasped the shaggy man it's all my fault said twiffle despondently i must have exposed the gravity plates too much when i adjusted them i was so afraid the plane would fall when the airmobile passed into the area of gravity it shot upward now it is lost to us forever twiffle looked as if he was about to weep cheer up twiffle said the shaggy man maybe we can get the airmobile back shaggy turned to the lord high mayor and asked since we can walk on air as well as you couldn't we just walk up there and climb into the airmobile you could if you wanted to stop breathing said the lord high mayor cheerfully why do you say that asked the shaggy man because exclaimed the lord high mayor we have discovered that the higher up you go the thinner the air becomes at the altitude now attained by your craft the air would be so thin that it would be unbreathable anyway said twink with a sigh the airmobile isn't there any more they all stared upward the girl was right the speck that had been the airmobile had vanished completely wonder where it went said twink the lord high mayor exclaimed pompously apparently your craft attained so great a speed that it shot off into space beyond the power of gravity from now on there's no telling where it will go and astronomers will report that folks from earth are about to visit another world i suppose grinned the shaggy man too bad old conjo isn't in it grumbled twiffle the question is said tom what do we do now right agreed the shaggy man as he turned to the lord high mayor and asked sir can you tell us how we can leave high town and proceed on our journey you wish to leave high town where could you possibly wish to go inquired the lord high mayor well eventually we hope to reach the emerald city in the land of oz replied the shaggy man so we're heading for the deadly desert surrounding the land of oz then we'll have to figure out some way to cross the desert the lord high mayor stared at shaggy in horror the deadly desert he exclaimed do you mean to stand here in the sky and tell me you actually wish to go near that terrible burning dry waste of shifting deadly sands when you can stay here and enjoy the delightful perfection of the aerial climate of hightown no began the shaggy man patiently we don't like the desert any more than you do but in order to get to oz we must cross the desert i assure you the land of oz has climate just as delightful as that of hightown that is impossible declared lord high mayor indignantly hightown has the only perfect climate in the world and now that you are here you might as well stay and enjoy it wonder if he ever heard of california murmured tom to twink we would like very much to stay and enjoy your climate your honor replied the shaggy man but it is impossible we must be on our way to the land of oz much as we admire your high airs so if you will kindly tell us how we may leave your town we will be much obliged the lord high mayor seemed to be deep in thought leave our town he said incredulously i don't believe it no one would want to leave high town it is the pinnacle of civilization the highest point in high life ever reached by man sir 
I conclude that I must have misunderstood you. It is beyond comprehension that you should wish to depart from this exalted community and go crawling about the lowly earth like a worm. I simply must have misunderstood you. There's nothing wrong with your ears, replied the shaggy man. I said it, and I'll say it again. We want to leave Hightown. Maybe we haven't advanced to the state where we fully appreciate your high flouten ways, and if you want to know the truth, we actually like to feel the earth beneath our feet. The Lord High Mayor stared at the shaggy man unbelievingly. There was a suspicion of tears in his eyes. My poor dear fellow, he said, how I grieve for you to have such low tastes. The earth under one's feet, ugh. But then, he went on brightening, you have not been here long enough to appreciate the soaring virtues of life in Hightown. Once you have become accustomed to the lofty pain on which we live and the superiority we enjoy over earth crawlers, I am sure that all the sod in the world will not tempt you to put a foot upon earth again. Please, said the shaggy man in exasperation, will you stop talking like the Chamber of Commerce and tell us how we can get back to earth? The Lord High Mayor eyed Shaggy narrowly. Well, he said, if you insist on leaving Hightown, you could walk to the boundary there, where gravity begins again. Step over and fall very quickly to earth. That is the fastest way I can think of leaving Hightown. But I wouldn't recommend it. No, no, the Shaggy Man assured him. We have no desire to fall to the earth. Shaggy looked below him with a shudder. We would be in no shape to continue our travels if we did that. Well then, you see, it is all settled, said the Lord High Mayor with a beaming smile. You will stay with us. Everything is settled, and there is not the slightest doubt that you will find Hightown, the garden spot of the sky. Now, since I am the Lord High Mayor of Hightown, it is my elevated privilege and honor to welcome you and make you comfortable. You will please follow me on what is the most fortunate journey of your life, for you are on your way to savoring the high and flighty life of Hightown. There seemed nothing else to do, so Shaggy and his friends followed the Lord High Mayor, stepping gingerly on what seemed to them to be the airiest space. As the mayor proceeded, the crowd of curious high towners made way for him and the little company of adventurers. May I inquire, asked Twiffle, where you are taking us? Why, to my air castle, of course, answered the Lord High Mayor. Since you are guests, you must be treated with the greatest courtesy. Later, we will find a permanent dwelling for you. They had now reached the center of the small town, and here the Lord High Mayor paused before a dwelling that was a little different from any of the other houses which were scarcely more than bungalows, except that they were all quite high and narrow to suit the shapes of the high towners. This is your air castle? asked the shaggy man. It looks no different from the other houses. And why should it be different? demanded the Lord High Mayor. Here we all live in air castles. You people who crawl around on the earth just dream of them. We are privileged to enjoy them. This last was said with an air of great pride. One thing did distinguish the Lord High Mayor's dwelling from the others in the town. Directly in front of it there stood a handsome flower pot in which was blossoming a beautiful magnolia. The Lord High Mayor paused to enjoy the delightful aroma of the flower. Ah, magnolia, that means we shall have a south wind soon. You visitors are indeed fortunate to have arrived in Hightown at this time. I'm not so sure we would be fortunate to arrive at any time, grumbled Twiffle. 
you see the mayor went on disregarding twiffle's remark when the magnolia blossoms that means south wind is coming and that means we shall soon have a delightful southern cloud on which to walk i assure you there is nothing more delightful than walking on a southern cloud seems to me clouds of any sort would be sort of squiggy for walking purposes no matter how pretty they are to look at said the shaggy man what happens when there's a north wind coming asked twink curiously oh then the plant blossoms with a beautiful wild thyme and we are privileged to enjoy that delightful scent when there's an east wind on its way the lord high mayor continued then the plant bears chrysanthemums when the west wind is coming we enjoy the blossoms and scent of wild roses doesn't the west wind bring rain clouds asked tom remembering that it usually did in buffalo yes said the mayor that's right then it rains here in hightown where you have a perfect climate asked the boy remembering his disgust with the rain at home not at all replied the mayor there is no gravity to pull the raindrops earthward so it can't rain we just go out wading in the rain cloud that is quite a plant said the shaggy man staring at the flower pot with its beautiful blossoms it's much more than that said the mayor certainly since we have the most perfect weather in the world in high town we would have the most perfect weather forecaster that's just what the plant is while tom was trying to puzzle out why if high town always had perfect weather it needed any weather forecaster at all the door of the mayor's home opened and they were welcomed by a tall thin woman in a blue check bungalow apron she proved to be the mayor's wife the good woman immediately served dinner hurrying about and doing her best to make the visitors at home she was particularly pleasant to twink and tom and was greatly amazed and a little awed by twiffle strangely enough the food consisted entirely of fruits but they were all fresh and tasty when the meal was over the lord high mayor announced that it was time for a nap a nap exclaimed the shaggy man why it is only a little past noon we can't sleep now it is the custom in high town remarked the mayor placidly and you will soon come to enjoy the siesta as much as we however if you cannot sleep you may sit on the front porch but don't go off the porch and wander about as you may come to the edge of the town and fall to the earth with this the lord mayor and his wife retired to their room and the visitors were left to themselves there seemed nothing else to do but to follow the mayor's suggestion and while away the town's hour asleep on the front porch here they found several chairs and a swing and soon made themselves comfortable there was nothing interesting about the scenery and little to talk about and they were beginning to be a bit bored when a saucy brown wren flitted out of the sky and perched on the porch railing regarding shaggy and his friends with bright little eyes strangers here aren't you asked the bird fine place to live you'll like it i'm sure we don't like it and we don't intend to stay said the shaggy man a bit ill-humouredly well if you don't like it then why don't you leave right away asked the bird how asked shaggy walk to the edge of the town and fall to earth we can't fly like you you know you don't need to fly you can walk down through the air or rather swim down using your arms to push you through the air there's no gravity you know and with a flirt of its saucy tail the bird was gone with a shout twiffle leaped to his feet what fools we've been of course there's no gravity and we can push ourselves right down to earth come on let's be on our way twiffle ran to the edge of the porch and leaped off head first they could see the little clown below them 
moving his arms like a swimmer. Should we try it? asked the shaggy man doubtfully. Tom didn't wait for an answer. He jumped from the porch just as Twiffle had done. He found that moving his arms he could force himself downward. Indeed, it was no more effort than walking on a level on the air. In a short time he discovered that, since there was no gravity, he could move at will up or down through the air. Now Twink was at his side, thoroughly enjoying the novel experience. The shaggy man was following close behind. Twink glanced upward once and saw the spectacle of a whole town, suspended in the air above her. She could even make out the mayor's house and the flower pot in front of it. They were all swimming earthward at about the same level, when there was a flirt of small wings and the wren who had spoken to them on the porch of the Lord High Mayor's house alighted on the shaggy man's shoulder. I see you took my advice, said the wren. Yes, said the shaggy man, and we are grateful to you for telling us about this easy way to leave Hightown. Think nothing of it, replied the wren airily. I always feel sorry for anyone who gets stuck in Hightown. There isn't a stupider place in the world. Those Hightowners have never seen anything but their own silly little town, so they just can't imagine there's anything else in the world. You get around quite a bit, I suppose, ventured the shaggy man. Being a bird, naturally, retorted the wren with a saucy flirt of his tail. Well then, said Shaggy, would you mind doing your own flying and get off my shoulder? That's gratitude for you, said the wren reproachfully. I save you from a life of boredom, and you refuse to let me hitchhike down to earth. But the bird didn't move from Shaggy's shoulder. Where are you going? Anywhere in particular? asked Twink. Oh, yes, of course, the wren replied. Just below High Town, there is a lovely orchard of all kinds of fruit trees. That's where the High Towners get all their food. They live on fruit. They can boast about their silly town all they like, but when they want food, you can bet they hurry down to the orchard on earth for it. That's why they don't like us birds. We enjoy eating the fruit in the orchard, too. We seldom go near High Town, except when the people are asleep. They are so disagreeable they throw things at us and accuse us of stealing from their orchard. Their orchard, indeed. Tell me, said the shaggy man, was your mother a magpie? Of course not, replied the wren indignantly. I thought she might have been, said the shaggy man, because you certainly chattered like a magpie. That's enough, declared the wren. If you can't appreciate intelligent conversation, I shan't waste it upon you. You are far too slow for me anyway. No hard feelings, though. Good luck to all of you. And with that, the wren was off, darting swiftly earthward. Shaggy and his friends all had a good laugh over the gossipy little bird. Ten minutes more swimming brought them within sight of the orchard about which the bird had told them. The high town sign says altitude 15,000 feet, said Tom. That's almost three miles. I can't believe we've been swimming that far. Probably they boosted that figure as high as their opinion of high town said twiffle and anyway it did say the altitude varied varies very much i say a few minutes later they were standing on the earth in a grove of apple plum and cherry trees every branch was filled with ripe luscious fruit twink looked for their friend the wren but saw nothing of him the shaggy man began looking about the ground for apples suddenly he laughed that was really stupid of me, he called to Twink and Tom. Of course there aren't any apples on the ground. They can't fall off the trees. This must be where the high towners get their fruit, said Twink. Of course, replied Shaggy. 
they thought they would keep us with them by not telling us how easy it is to reach the earth from hightown but they must have known we would see some of them coming and going to the orchard and find out sooner or later how to escape said tom well thanks to that bird we found out sooner said twiffle before they left the grove shaggy walked in the air to the upper branches of the biggest apple tree in the orchard and filled his pockets with the largest and ruddiest of the fruit can't tell where we'll find our next meal he explained knowing the area that was freed from the force of gravity was a very small extent shaggy and his friends walked steadily in one direction treading several feet in the air since that was easiest than walking on the earth as there was no difference in the appearance of the countryside where gravity exerted itself again they had no way of telling when they would suddenly emerge from the gravity less land shaggy was the lead when he suddenly experienced that curious sensation that comes when you step unexpectedly into a hole the result was that shaggy toppled forward and found himself sprawled on the grass following him came twink tom and twiffle only tom managed to maintain his balance what he had realized in time was simply that the others had stepped off the air on which they had been walking to the earth a foot or two below them the shaggy man sighed give me the earth to crawl around on any day as our friend the lord high mayor would put it even though it does mean an occasional tumble end of chapter eight chapter nine of shaggy man in oz this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c shaggy man in oz by jack snow the valley of romance before the travellers lay one of the most beautiful valleys they had ever seen gently sloping hills led down to green fields through the middle of the valley flowed a stream that looked like a shimmering blue ribbon stretched out on a green carpet on the near bank of the stream in the very center of the valley stood a castle its spires turrets and towers were so delicately formed that they glistened like lace filigree in the sunlight twink's eyes glowed isn't it just the most beautiful sight you ever saw she exclaimed it certainly is elegant admitted the shaggy man but what we want to know is what kind of folks live in it oh i'm sure they must be very happy and contented said twink they just must be to live in a place like that then we are going to visit the castle asked triffle a bit doubtfully it seems the only thing to do replied the shaggy man i admit i have no idea where we are and there is just the possibility that whoever lives in the castle may be able to help us get to oz or at least give us directions to the deadly desert tom was already on his way running happily down the green slope toward the stream and the castle a ten-minute walk in the bright sunlight brought the little group of adventurers to the doors of the castle so far they had seen no living persons birds sang in the trees and once a white rabbit had bounded across tom's path but there were no signs of human beings the shaggy man stepped forward and knocked boldly on the heavy door instantly it swung silently open as the adventurers stepped inside twink gasped and even the shaggy man accustomed as he was to the splendor of ozma's royal palace was impressed with the magnificence of his surroundings 
the floor and walls of the castle were of the whitest alabaster polished so that the creamy depths of the stone mirrored the luxurious furnishings casting a lustre that enhanced the woven richness of the deep-hued draperies in the panelled walls who had built such a castle each of the travellers tried to picture in his own mind the kind of people who might live here would they be friendly or unfriendly helpful or dangerous still there was no sign of people the only sound that broke the stillness of the foyer in which shaggy and his friends stood was the tinkling of water as it flowed from a small fountain in the centre of the room this fountain was fashioned like an ordinary drinking fountain the stream of water that rose from it being no more than three or four inches in height around the rim of the alabaster fountain was a metal plate with writing inscribed upon it her curiosity aroused twink advanced to the fountain and read this is a fountain any visitors are requested to speak their messages into it signed rex ticket and regina curtain what in the world can it mean whispered twink her companions had gathered about her and were reading the metal plate with wonder rex and regina ventured the shaggy man our king and queen that's latin so evidently the head folks of this castle are king ticket and queen curtain hm certainly odd names for a king and queen a fountain and we're supposed to talk into it sniffed twiffle with disgust who ever heard of such nonsense well observed the shaggy man i've heard of babbling books so why not a talking fountain that will carry our words a phony fountain i suppose said tom grinning shaggy stooped over the fountain and spoke clearly and distinctly this is the shaggy man of oz speaking in behalf of my friends twink and tom of the united states of america twiffle late of the isle of conjo and myself i request an audience with king ticket and queen curtain almost immediately a red neon sign lighted up over two large double doors at the opposite end of the foyer the sign flashed the single word entrance i guess this is where we go in remarked shaggy man as he walked to the door and pushed the large metal handle they were in a small brightly lighted theatre containing about one hundred seats on the stage seated on two thrones were a man and woman evidently king ticket and queen curtain all about the king and queen on the stage there was a bustle of the most frenzied activity there sounded the clash and clatter of hammers the ripping of saws and the whirring of drills and bits perhaps fifteen or twenty men were hard at work knocking together and erecting a bewildering array of scenery calmly seated about the stage on three cornered stools their sewing baskets at their sides were a number of ladies sewing on costumes others were apparently sewing together large pieces of canvas still other ladies were engaged in painting artistic pictures on the canvas which was then stretched on wooden frameworks to serve as backdrops for the stage after shaggy and his friends had watched this display of industry for several minutes they advanced down the middle aisle of the theater the king and queen had been doing no actual work they merely issued directions to others who seemed not to pay them the slightest heed but continued with their tasks king ticket looked up well he said to the shaggy man you certainly took your time getting here it was at least three minutes ago that you announced yourselves on the fountain do you mean you really heard us through that water fountain 
asked the shaggy man. Water hath a limpid tongue with which to lave the naked ear, said King Ticket, in a voice which was meant to be impressive. Of course we heard you through the fountain. There are fountains in all the rooms of the castle, even in the theater, here, which repeat messages when we speak into them. Twink thought this was much nicer than telephones which rudely jangling bells, although probably not as private. You didn't think, commented Queen Curtain, as though she had read Twink's thoughts, that we would use ordinary means of communication, such as telephones, in the Valley of Romance, did you? Oh, said the shaggy man, is this the Valley of Romance? It is, and since you are from the land of Oz, said King Ticket, you must surely have heard of the Valley of Romance. The shaggy man reflected. It seemed he could recall Ozma mentioning something about some such valley, but he couldn't remember anything that she had said about it. How far are we from the land of Oz? asked Twiffle. Dear me! exclaimed king ticket staring at twiffle for a moment i thought you were real i am real stated twiffle with dignity i just don't happen to be made of flesh and blood and bones that's all and as far for the land of oz remarked queen curtain meditatively it is indeed very far away over the stream and over the hill far far away to the desert and then over that too in fact it isn't even in the valley of romance so that means it must be quite some distance off too far even to think of she added as though to say that closed the subject the shaggy man shrugged evidently these two weren't going to be much of help to the travelers in finding their way back to oz well they would make a lunch of the apples he carried in his pockets and then continue on their journey shaggy and his friends made themselves comfortable in the deeply upholstered seats in the front row of the theater shaggy divided the apples between twink tom and himself he offered several to king ticket and queen curtain who refused them rather disdainfully. Shaggy and his friends ate in silence while they watched the activity on the stage. Not one of the busy working men and women seemed even to be aware of the presence of the strangers. Finishing his apples, the shaggy man arose and said, Looks like you folks are getting ready for quite a play. What's the name of it? unexpectedly one of the workers on a ladder stopped his task of hammering together a bit of framework for the scenery and replied to shaggy's question that we won't know until the curtain goes up tonight tonight's the first night of the new play and i shall be in charge the fellow added impressively for i am the first knight of the realm you know no replied the shaggy man i did not know shaggy was a little angry for he thought the man was making fun of him oh yes queen curtain went on placidly he is the first knight of the realm in fact all these people are lords and ladies of the royal theatre and do you always build your own scenery and you make your own costumes asked the shaggy man king ticket shifted uneasy on his throne yes and it always seems to turn out rather badly i suppose all we were really meant to do was to enjoy the magnificent performances on the stage and the king brightened that is all we truly have any desire to do that is a full life for us and quite enough to sit in the theater and watch great drama unfold what need have we for any lives of our own when the stage is a world in itself and therein we are content to dwell 
the king's voice gently subsided to a whisper and his eyes stared dreamily into space queen curtain took up the story during the performances lord props and lady q helped the actors although none too well i must admit lord props seldom gets things right when a gunshot is called for there is very likely to be a bell ringing once when the scene required a bowl of goldfish lord props actually managed to cram a whole live lobster into a soup tureen lady q does however manage to do a bit better with her cues she is seldom more than two lines behind the actors how long do your plays run asked shaggy night after night after glorious night for years and years and years sometimes as long as we can remember there has been the same wonderful play for us to see on the stage at night said the king who had awakened from his dream and what do you do the rest of the time queried the shaggy man nothing nothing but sleep answered king ticket why should we we have the glorious stage for our lives the king looked about him at the work going on who are your actors asked tom for a moment king ticket seemed embarrassed then he replied vaguely with a wave of his hand as if to dismiss the matter as of little importance oh just actors you know the usual thing leading man leading lady villain comedian and so forth come said the shaggy man we're wasting time here we should be on our way if we ever hope to reach the land of oz queen curtain looked up you won't stay for dinner and the theater no thank you replied shaggy we have a long journey ahead of us and we really must be going on our way now with this shaggy and his friends walked up the aisle toward the door by which they had entered the theater king ticket had been staring intently at the shaggy man and now he whispered something in a low voice to queen curtain the queen considered for a moment and then nodded her head twink and tom who were directly behind the shaggy man stopped and stared at each other they were only halfway up the aisle the shaggy man had been only a step ahead of them now he was gone vanished completely end of chapter nine